You're watching a special episode of Reality Check. We appear to be at an inflection point for the deadly second wave of the coronavirus in India. On one hand, the virus curve appears to be flattening, perhaps even dropping off. But the true cost, the true economic toll that it has taken is only now starting to come into view. How do we negotiate the maze of challenges that lie ahead? Who better to take us through that than Professor Abhijit Banerjee, a Nobel laureate and a Ford Foundation Professor of International Economics at MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, joins me from Boston. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Professor Banerjee, for uh, joining me. Let me just start by asking you a kind of big picture view of from afar as you watch the path of the virus in India, the path of the vaccination program in India, and also the economic uh, cost that it has taken. What are you seeing? What, what worries you? And if at all, is there anything that gives you optimism? Well, I think the good news is that at least in the big cities, uh, for till today, the, the number of infections were dropping. The, certainly, it's the case that the, you see that the ICUs are less full. I, I did see a, something that just worried me, which is in Pune, there was a sudden uptick in the number of, um, of infections today, but hopefully that's just an accident or that they're doing better measurement now. Um, and that's sort of what I think everybody was hoping for. These lockdowns were, were intended to achieve that, and they did. I think lockdowns, I think we, one thing we've learned is that lockdowns work. I, I, I think the, the question, as you are implying, is at what cost and uh, with what consequence. But it's certainly the case that lockdowns uh, do seem to control mm. the disease. Right. Now, I know you said that you can't get away from lockdowns, but lockdowns do come with an economic cost and some of those numbers that are coming out you might be conversant with them as well seem alarming one report suggests that close to 230 million or about 23 crore more indians may have been pushed into poverty uh, i think this is largely during the first wave uh, cmi which tracks unemployment says that uh, about a crore of people may have lost their jobs just in the month of may from january to may another crore may have lost their jobs and we are seeing ground evidence of this as well. The question once again comes up is that are the safety nets that the government keeps claiming to that it has put out sufficient to be able to address this kind of distress? Oh, I don't think that even the government seriously thinks that the safety nets is what's going to uh, deal with this distress. I should say one thing, which is that I think these numbers should be uh, I, I think they are worrying, but I think they should be seen in the context of, of, a, of a country where many people just about cross the, that poverty line uh, when, uh, when the, just about cross the poverty line when, when uh, the pandemic hit. So this, these are not people who had a lot of cushion. And a lot of them were actually, for example, if you, if you're from rural West Bengal, but you work in Mumbai, you can make 20,000 uh, rupees a mm -hmm. month and send uh, most of that home. And with that and some other agricultural earnings and maybe some earnings from, from NREGA that some other family member gets, you could be over the poverty line. That's not, this is, these are not people who are doing like high quality jobs. They're working in construction in largely semi-skilled or unskilled jobs. And even then that gets you above our poverty line. So I think this idea, uh, in fact, the, the World Bank right. poverty line, which are not that different. And I think that, that that means that these people were just above. So I think that to say that, you know, uh, this, uh, that they have gone below that line, is that how worrying is that? Well, it's a little bit symbolic. And it's, I mean, it's clearly reflects something that's in general not good news. But on the other hand, you might imagine that it takes some, um, it doesn't take a lot for them to go back up. I think the real question is, does the economy revive uh, uh, the overall, the construction sectors, yes. the, the retail sectors, the transportation sectors, these are the sectors which, you know, the the restaurants, this is where a lot of un unskilled labor, uh, semi-skilled labor is employed. And if these revive, then 
maybe these people will go back. I mean, I think they'll be a little bit cherry of going back because they've been burnt. They felt like, okay, this is a twi second time they had to just get out. Uh, there was a lockdown. There was nothing they, they had, could do. And our welfare system isn't really mm -hmm. uh, even designed for that world. So it's not like, you know, if, you, if you're in a, a rural migrant to urban areas, you have really no access to welfare. Uh, so I, I think that the, I don't think anybody believes that right. whatever we are doing through the free food or it, these are sort of stopgap measures which are not they're all good but I think that overall the government hasn't done a huge amount I would say uh, in terms of in this way in particular it's, I think the idea was that you know the economy still remains more open uh, and and the fact that the decision to lock down was put in the hands of the states means that the state you the states are really cash trapped they didn't really say that you know we're going to combine this with a large cash payment to everybody that's that wasn't i mean some states did Tamil Nadu did to sure. some extent but it's really not a not an option for most states but in that event then do you think it's still not too late for the government to do something that you and many, many others have been advocating right from the first wave, which is to do significant cash transfers, particularly to those at the bottom end of the economic pyramid, as a, as a starting point? I think that's, that, I think, would still be a good idea. I think, for example, um, two things that the government could do easily one would just be very reassuring which is to say that you know instead of 100 days of uh, narega you could have 150 days of uh, narega uh, which means and the the, uh, the fiscal year is just starting so right now nobody used it up but people are going to worry that you know if these lockdowns keep coming and you know you keep looking for you know some way to survive Mm. Would you want to use it now? Would you wait? And I think if, if people were told this 150 days, I think they would be less willing to wait now. They would just go and work and get some more money in their hands. That would be a relatively easy thing to do, as would be, right. for example, uh, do what Tamil Nadu has done, which is uh, with the PDS, you give families uh, a chunk of money. Anybody, anybody with PDS, you can collect I think in Tamil Nadu it's 4,000 rupees, but some number, not huge, but some amount of money which will then That's be right. reassuring. It will lead to consumption spending, which people are obviously cherry off because they, they know, don't know when, wh how the country will uh, negotiate the next few months. So I, I think that it's, it is a, it's a moment where it would really reassure people and get them to maybe, maybe spend more. Would would you have some sort of ballpark of what kind of amount would be significant enough at a time like this? Uh, I think uh, if you, if, if the, I think some something like that, four thousand rupees for, for wherever in whichever district of the country is now under lockdown, I think would already for family per month. Mm already for every PDS family, which is about 75% of these families, I think they will already have a substantial effect on, on, on these families. There would be much less insecurity. It was, it was just a promise that whenever there's a lockdown, the center, which is the only really liquid, um, liquid government, says that we will provide uh, some more uh, cash assistance to, to the states to pay out through the PDS system. I, I don't think that's ideal because the PDS system, as you know, excludes migrants, for example. Uh, you know, if, you're, if you are living in a in lot of people, Bombay, yes. Yeah, but it's still, it would be a, a good starting point. Right. But for reasons that have not been entirely clear, right from last year, the government seems to have been reluctant to do that. There have been some cash outlays, but much smaller numbers uh, than of the kind that you mentioned. There's been a whole lot of other ways of trying to infuse liquidity into the system through making lending easier to small businesses and so on. But there hasn't been that kind of cash or income support. And, and that's yeah. worrying a lot of people. Yeah, I think that, that is worrying, worrying because it, it, I think the, what happened in the 
first wave was uh, was uh, not just the the the, the 25% shrinkage, 24% shrinkage in GDP, that was partly a result of a demand shock. And in any case, people, I've been saying, and many others, I mean, I'm not the first or the last person to be saying this, that the economy was even before yeah. that, even in 2019, demand uh, constrained. And so I think I think there is a sense in which uh, you, you you could do, do a lot more to, to make people uh, reassure people that their economic well-being will be uh, will be uh, right. foremost in the mind of the government, which will then get them to spend, which will then have the positive multiplier. I think this is this is after all what you know uh, the U.S. has done. The U.S. has been incredibly uh, and is still doing, in a sense, is incredibly open-handed with its money uh, throughout this period. Yes, I, I wanted to get you talking a little bit about that uh, because we do follow some of what's happening from here, but it'll be also good to just hear from you a sense of how it's working with other countries like the US, even the UK to some extent, that are actually handing out these, these COVID, you know, like almost <coughs> social security, just, uh, just checks, cash to, to, to people, to businesses. Yeah, so I, I think that... You know, the, the U.S. basically went in with an extremely generous, by U.S. standards, welfare program. People, any unemployed person would get $600 per week. Um, that's a lot of money by U.S. welfare standards. What France did, uh, you, you said uh, you, I was speaking to from the U.S., in fact, I'm speaking, speaking from France. What France did was uh, to basically put uh, put in place a furlough system so everybody who's who was working is now being who but cannot work because of the lockdown is now being supported by the by the government and this was actually a, a, a kind of a, a remarkable shift in a sense in sort of fiscal wisdom uh, the, because typically the European Central Bank is famously conservative in in uh, its spending plans, but in fact, mm. in that one moment, they decided uh, that they just needed to do what it takes, as famously was stated. And it, what it took was to spend a lot of money, and they printed money to spend it. Right. Well, how would you? Uh, respond to those who say uh, here uh, when this question comes up that oh we can't compare ourselves to these first world economies we're a poor country we can't afford to 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 do these sorts of generous handouts is that a credible argument at all well i i, I mean maybe the u.s spent 20 percent of gdp maybe 20 percent of gdp is hard for us i think both sides i i'm not sure we are able to uh, you know, finance that. I think there might well be a, you know, substantial effect on on interest rates if we try to do that. And there might well be um, also just not easy to spend that much money that fast. We're really not set up for, you know, quick turnaround. So, and I mean, partly uh, think about the fact that in the US, to do what France did, you need everybody who's employed mm. being recorded somewhere. If they're not recorded anywhere, there's no way you can do right. what the what the uh, what France did. And so, since most people are in the informal sector, that is just no, even getting the, that much cash out is difficult. So I don't think the government could have done what uh, we just don't have the kind of um, infrastructure uh, to do that. And I think I, I and I think that's probably reasonable. Uh, right at our stage of development is probably hard to do but what we couldn't what we didn't do which i think is I, I, let me give you the example of a country like togo far less sophisticated than us but they had uh, one thing that we could easily do which is to have a phone based uh, phone based transfer system um, and the, what the government did was it said essentially wherever there'll be a lockdown we'll send a small amount of money to people's phones uh, to allow them to survive. And they just implemented it for a while, then they ran out of money, then the World Bank actually eventually gave them, an, an, I think, an idea loan to, to allow them to, uh, to uh, continue that. But I think, I think that, that, that we, 
we, we actually it. don't have the setup for that. We can't do it. If we tried, we wouldn't be able to do it, unfortunately. Right. So the, you're saying that we may not have the capacity to do something similar to these Western powers, but we could have attempted something else. I mean, even if it's more I mean, limited. We could have done what uh, um, Togo did. To Togo is not, know, uh, not, not exactly the country yes. that sort of leads the world in software yes. or something. So they could do it, we could do it. Sure. Some, yeah, some sort of more low-tech, uh, simple solution. But in the event, that we, we, we don't take that path, what kind of scenarios are we likely to see? Well, I, I think that the, the, uh, the optimistic view is that we somehow this time get it right. We do actually uh, vaccinate the population and the vaccine actually works. Both of those are not obvious, but let's say both of those right. happen. Then you might imagine that basically we go back to the economic um, model that was more or less working uh, before uh, before uh, the pandemic, that it was uh, it wasn't. I think the economy was slowing uh, after 2016. You do see that the data suggests that the economy was slowing. Maybe even before 2016, there's some disagreement, but mm. about the data because the data is disputed. But nonetheless, I mean, sometime. Uh, before that, the economy was generating lots of these low-skilled to semi-skilled, mostly, you know, service sector jobs or construction jobs, and that would be uh, that would be probably rest possible to restore. And there's nothing deep about the nature of, you know, uh, the way the economy functions that uh, has changed from that point of view. If people are willing to work, I think the real worry is people are going to be scared of going to, uh, you know, Mumbai to work because then they remember that previous episode. I know even in between the two waves, Tamil Nadu was labor scarce and was trying to send yeah. buses to West Bengal to get, uh, get laborers to come back. So I, I think if the labor supply is there, then the economy can go back to that uh, path. I don't think there's anything deep deeply uh, okay. deeply changed by the pandemic. I think the economy was already not, I think in general the strategy of, I think, um, of the last few years has, has, I think, had some depressing effect of, on the growth rate. But I don't think that it's, uh, it was, there's no reason why we couldn't go back to the 2016 to 19 growth rate. Right. Just last question to you, Professor. Uh, you know, during a conversation I was having with one of the top functionaries of Niti Aayog, which as you know is our uh, preeminent yeah, policy yeah. think tank, I know, I know. about the idea of cash transfers, he said, he said something along the lines of, oh, this is helicopter money, uh, you know, you give it to the poor and they'll all just put it either in their piggy banks or in an actual bank, nothing will get spent, it won't drive consumption. Uh, this was a, a this was the response. How, what, what do you make of it? Because there's this constant kind of, you know, sense that that if you give the poor cash, uh, they'll misspend it or not really deploy it strategically. Is this the opposite? Uh, your this is studies saying that have, they will have not often spend found it. the contrary. Yeah, yeah. They, they, this is the misspend it is the old-fashioned view. This is the new view that the poor will, will vanish into the uh, piggy banks. I, I do think that. The, 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 this might, the, this is a real concern. That's why I say that you have to reassure them that this will be done every time there is a lockdown. I think if you tell people that you know this is the one last time you get it after this, you know, if uh, if there is more lockdowns, you're on your own. Then of course that's the rational thing to do. And I think people are pretty smart. I think you have to somehow reassure them. That's why I say 150 days of Narega actually might be very cheap because you might actually say, look, you know, eventually I don't want Narega. I have a job. I want okay. to do my job. Uh, but the assurance that I will be able to able to survive means I'm going to be willing to spend more. And if I'm willing to spend more, maybe there'll be more jobs. And then maybe the Narega thing won't be even be needed. That's sort of why I'm pushing that. As a, This is the beginning of the, of the, of the fiscal year. So there is a whole year of, 
of that will be covered by this 150 days. So something like that might well be a, a really quite, you know, long sort of assure people that the fu their future is uh, the near future, the one year future is assured in some ways. Right. Okay, that's a, that's a, that sounds like a very sensible suggestion. But thank you so much uh, for taking time out and talking to us, Professor. Thanks very much. Yeah, sure, sure. Uh, very nice to talk to you.